How's your day going? Oh, it's been a it's been a busy day, but you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my father in law has been. He he recently had an amputation on one of his legs, so he's been oh. in physical rehab. Yeah. And of course, wow. physical rehab is 30 minutes away. So on our days off, we just, uh, my partner and I, we just go up there to see him. Yeah. And he can be a bit difficult, so it takes us a while. But Well, he's missing a leg, basically a yeah. pirate now. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, I was going to ask you if you had all your limbs, but we might get into that. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's awesome. <laughs> Keep it up. That's great. <laughs> okay. Got to test the waters. That was kind of extreme, though. Yeah. No, it's fine. <laughs> What's your um? You done with college and studies and stuff? Or are you continuing? Um. Well, so with college, basically, I um I got my general associates degree at like a Wake. Um. Well, sorry, I shouldn't probably shouldn't dox myself, but basically a community college in my area. Um. I uh. It was like. It was the kind of degree that you would usually take to transfer to a bigger school. I ended up never transferring to a, like a bigger school, um, yeah. just so you can get like general credits out the way and all that. Um, and uh, I wanted to do like web design for a while. I've I've gone back and forth so many times. I've probably switched my major at that college like so often, and life keeps happening. I've just never gotten around to getting past that first degree. So I just okay. I work as a department retail manager now. I actually really really like it, and. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm either going to work my way through the ranks or go back for something business related. So we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Opportunity abounds for you then. Oh, yeah. 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 Job security and retail, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people are always going to buy stuff. Going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of an accident, actually, because I worked in kitchens beforehand and like during COVID. And mm -hmm. then obviously those all closed. Um, and so I was without a job for a little bit started working in the deli at a grocery store and then i kind of was able to get full-time hours and you know became a department manager after that so yeah what do you enjoy neat. about the job honestly i love crunching numbers i love like analyzing sales and that kind of thing you know it's kind of like a game for me to try and you know make more money than i did last year so it's pretty hmm. cool <laughs> oh wow fun. yeah yeah it's fun and artistic uh, endeavors or social yeah. So ironically Stop. enough, like this, maybe this is too much detail, but I'm, I'm fine yeah. sharing it. So the, the, some grocery stores on the East coast, they have floral departments. So I actually get to design like floral arrangements and that kind of thing. So interestingly, there are some like, uh, artistic aspects to my job, but outside of that, yeah, I draw, I've done music in the past. I like to, you know, paint and, you know, write as well. So I'm a pretty art artsy person. Yeah. Have you been journaling since time immemorial? Um, I have been journaling on and off, like probably my whole life. There's like a big box in the garage with like old journals of mine. I don't think I ever finished a full notebook because I would always like it's, stuff would always happen. I was I would always forget to write something down. But now yeah. I've got my phone, so I just write it up in my notes app. I try to do it like you know pretty pretty regularly. Yeah. Well, I mean th yeah. that's good uh, background to discuss like your relationship to gender and sex you know and yeah, biology sure. and stuff like that when did those thoughts enter your mind um it's really hard to say because like you know they they talk about it it's either you know you either get it before puberty or during puberty and i can't really remember when i hit puberty so it's so kind of like it's a gray area for me there's some mm -hmm. there's some things about childhood i just don't really remember that well um but i want to say that like maybe around 10 or 12 is when I first was like, I'm a boy, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I can't even remember exactly what my logic was at the time. It was kind of yeah. like, I, you know, there's, there's ways that things go on in your brain, right? So you can, you can get a bunch of input from your surroundings and then come to a conclusion based on that input, or you can come to a conclusion and then use that input from your surroundings is kind of like an excuse to use it like you know come to that conclusion so for yeah. me it's like i definitely like wanted that you know i was always much more comfortable like seeing myself as a boy and you know uh, uh filling those like social roles and you know measuring myself to the male expectations was always like kind of what i leaned towards yeah um, I mean, you're a young yeah. american <laughs> right yeah so yeah. what 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 kind of gender expectations did you see in your society growing up? Well, I, I um, 
my my parents are actually um you know immigrants my mom is from germany my dad was born in portugal moved to canada um and then you know met my mom in germany actually and then they en ended up here um hmm. so I, I would say that like you know being raised catholic and all that i had like a very specific idea of what like a man looked like at that time um and i've i've thought about that a lot since i would say that like probably the biggest standard i see for men is like provide and protect those are the two big ones. Um, and I always kind of felt myself lean into that, you know, into that role or that's seeing like, you know, how is it, what's the best way to put it? It's like seeing myself as a provider or a protector always like made me feel more comfortable. Um, I also had like mostly male friends as a kid. And so, you know, I kind of wanted to fit in with them more. Um, so what they did, I wanted to do as well. Mm-hmm. What was your image of womanhood? It's hard to say. I, I feel like, you know, I've, I've listened to some of your uh, other talks with detransitioners, especially like uh, female to males. And um, I feel like I, I've heard a couple of them say they associate a womanhood with weakness. I want to say that was part of it for me, but that wasn't the whole thing. Because every time I would find myself feeling that way about womanhood, I would remember that there are strong women that I've met as well. Mm. Um but it was just there's something about it that I could just never relate to. So I think I ended up admiring womanhood much more than I ever related to it. Oh, okay. Huh. Yeah. I mean, because yeah. Catholic is steeped in female iconography. Iconography. You know, we get the Mary and you get your saints and stuff. Iconography. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're good. Messed up on that one. Um, <laughs> and uh, you see the martyrs and the saints and uh, the nuns. I mean, they're heroic in their own way and then mary is very central to uh, definitely. the myth the mythos definitely i know for a while this is this is where things in my childhood get kind of mixed up for a while i wanted to be a nun that was um like around nine years old there was a lot of women uh well there's a lot of nuns they came to my church they were like the sisters of life that was their um their order really lovely people and i mean i really gravitated towards them i uh sometimes i question why and i think it might have just been like they were young pretty females at my church that i could kind of like trust you know it was like there was a very like trusting uh, um feeling about them i guess it's like you could tell them anything you know obviously i'm a little kid so i'm just following these women around like you know trying to be like them and like well i wouldn't say be like them but like you know kind of try and impress them i guess i don't mm. i don't know why it was just um I, I really felt comfortable talking to them and that kind of thing, you know? Did you have a sense and of spirituality inside of the religion? For a while, yes. Um, there were times where I felt like I could hear God's voice talking to me. Um, and I really, like, I mean, I, nowadays I question it because I've, I've taken a different approach to my faith at this point. Um, I know that back then, that was kind of all I knew. So faith and religion was like a, a big part of my life just because like I was homeschooled. I didn't really leave the house very much. I'm the oldest of six kids, you know? So well, there's a lot of reasons why my mom couldn't just drive me to like, you know, uh, 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 what do you call them? Extracurricular programs outside of the house, you know? So yeah. even throughout high school, I would take online classes and I was in the house a, a lot of the time. And, um, I was, uh, I took my faith very seriously. I think there was an aspect of relaxed, I guess, relax, easygoingness that most Catholics have that I just did not have as a kid. I was very much like, these are the rules. I have to abide by them. It's very like strict and important, you know? Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Um, it kind of like a more rigid approach and everybody else seemed fine with it. Uh, um, I guess a good example of that would be like the act of contrition. You know, they say, I promise to sin no more and to amend my life. I was like, that makes no sense because I know I'm going to sin again. So why am I promising God of all people that I'm not going to do it again? It's mm -hmm. like, that doesn't really make much sense. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. And I think I, I carried around a lot of like guilt about not being able to measure up to these like religious rules, you know? Yeah, I didn't really yeah. get it. <laughs> but... Do you think that the rig rigidity that you experienced towards the rules of your religion transferred to a rigidity in how you thought of gender and sex? I've thought about that at times, um, and it's, I wouldn't say it's impossible for that to have played an, a, a part in it, you know, um, I, I, in my opinion, like anything relating to gender and sex is like a, in a, 
accumulation almost of like a bunch of different experiences you have plus whatever personality traits and genetics you're born with i think it's like a big soup of all of that you know so i i wouldn't i wouldn't put it past myself to have interpreted some of that rigidity or have like a bit of more a rigid view on gender that you know influenced me throughout my life um all i can say is that having that rigidity never really caused me any discomfort it actually seemed to work very well and i seemed much more relaxed seeing myself like uh more rigidly as a man than rigidly as a woman i guess mm -hmm. um in fact i think i think the one way it backfired is that for the longest time i didn't quite know what being trans meant i thought it was like this delusional that you were um that you were the opposite sex so that like you know they were just in complete denial of like the genitalia and whatever and the idea that that dis the dysphoria is that discrepancy just like i never really understood that as part of my criticism of the movement is that they front load all the crazy stuff and anybody who might be questioning if that's all they see they, they might never even go any deeper than that and i was one of those people i just i was like oh if it's just all about vibes and aesthetics that's not me i'm, I'm not you know part of that mm. um so yeah for the longest time i just I, I didn't quite know what that stuff meant and so the idea that well i'm a female so i have to just you know live as a woman and make the best of it that you know living a different life wasn't an option uh that's just how my my mind took it at the time so i hope mm. that makes sense that can be a little yeah. bit all over the place at times. that's so. fine thank you very much for you know for being willing to dive into this stuff it's very messy very complex yeah yeah you brought up like living a different life what would be different about your life if you hadn't have become trans um it's really hard to say i think i would have stayed in a perpetual state of immaturity that's the best way i can put it um huh. since transitioning I, I remember the the moment i decided i had to give it a shot you know i it was like it was the first time i had to actually acknowledge experiences i was having and not just uh, um you know kind of gaslight myself into thinking i wasn't feeling it you know so it was a huge moment for me, like like a breakthrough and just like acknowledging reality and said, okay, I've, I've had these feelings, you know, since I was a kid. I've always kind of shoved them down and they've always come back. And at this point I was dating somebody. And so they were starting to interview, they were starting to interfere with my relationship, you know? And so I was like, it's better to give it a shot and like, you know, acknowledge the feelings. And then if it doesn't work, I'll take whatever consequences come of it and hmm. I'll just figure it out from there. But I have to try first, you know? Um, and since then, I, I mean, the best way I can put it is, you know, you know, the difference between hearing music like a block away versus hearing it when you're at the concert yourself. Mm -hmm. It's like my whole life, I was living life from like a block down. And then when I started transitioning, it was like, I was like, a, um, much more aware of like everything around me. It was like, re really did feel like I was living for the first time. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's it's very bizarre. I have a hard time like describing it to people at times. This is, you know, so rare. Um, but I was able to like process emotions better. I felt my I found myself like confronting feelings that I had run away from my whole life. Um, a lot of healing took place. I, I was able to, yeah, I've been able to learn life lessons I would have never learned otherwise. I, I mean, it really does feel like, you know, I gave my life a shot for once and hmm. it worked out. But I'm one of the lucky ones, you know, a lot of people, it didn't work out. And, and, you know, I feel terrible that they had to go through all that. You know what yeah. I mean? What, so, you, what kind of feelings uh, that you so, were able to process? Like attraction? Uh, I think uh, attraction was one of the first that I felt even before transitioning. So, like, as far as, like, the sexuality aspect goes, um, I was attracted to girls from a young age. Um, I didn't notice it at the time because obviously sheltered household, they don't really talk about sex. So um, I, I didn't I didn't really know um, like how attraction worked. All I knew is that I really liked looking at inappropriate pictures of women, you know what I mean? Hmm. And so I was like, I mean, it was just there's something about that that I liked. And there was, there was obviously like a, a ton of guilt with that as well. Um, and down the line, I want to say like, attractions towards men definitely like came up but uh, i'm predominantly attracted to the feminine in general you know what i mean mm -hmm. um and that was like the easiest one for me to sort of latch on to early on because after my first relationship which was with a guy um i attributed my lack of attraction to that guy um to being like well i'm just not into guys you know 
Um, and that was good for a while. Uh, and then mainly because I, I can be quite a hedonist and women are very difficult to just get a one night stand with. I eventually started experimenting with men and that's kind of how I found out I was more bisexual. Um, but very much like I, I, my partner right now is a guy and I see this going, you know, quite a long way, but he's a big rarity um, for me to to be with, you know, uh, and if by some tragedy I were to lose him, I'd probably only go with women, you know, going forward. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. As bizarre as that might sound. <laughs> yeah. You are a special case. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I, uh, I think so, it was Maisie who said, like, everybody kind of wants to be special nowadays, so it's, it seems more like a compliment than just, like, a, an observation, <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah, well, don't let it go to your head, okay? That's, that's right, just I, I the most important. <laughs> so when you first uh, came across, when you were 10, 11, if you can remember this far back, mm -hmm. the idea, I'm a boy, was that an intrusive thought? Was that a wishful thought? Was that... Uh, Honestly, that... it... It felt mainly like a like a conclusion more than anything. It was like, well, this is just the way I am, and it just makes makes sense to me, you know. Um, I think like you know, saint characters like Joan of Arc uh, are definitely like a kind of like a boost to that feeling of like, oh yeah, girls can you know live as a man. Um, I think it, I think the mm. female to male experience is like uniquely different from the male to female one in how it's represented historically. The stigmas behind it and everything it's like you have many more uh, uh examples i think of like women cross-dressing as men and then making it in society uh there's even like the disney movie milan right They're the same thing where it's like you know you're there's a protective instinct there they they you know go into battle as a man and they end up doing you know great things with that um so i think like there is more room for me to kind of stay in that gray area of like subconsciously i can acknowledge myself as a guy but you know, for practical reasons, I'm a woman cross-dressing, you know, if that makes so sense. So, like, so you, yeah. you adopted the gendered um, dress of the opposite sex. Yes. Very, very early on. Um, I think I, I, I wore dresses in childhood. My grandmother made them for me. So when I was a little kid, like, you know, I'd run around in dresses. Sometimes I wonder how much of that was a sensory thing. Cause we live in the South. Let's get, it gets very hot here and, you know, having a skirt or a dress is like very nice. Um, but they were great. Uh, it worked for the time. And then I got a little older and I just wanted to look like a boy constantly. Um, I would do what I could to flatten my chest. I, there were a couple of times I even, I went in the bathroom, I locked it and I would put like the makeup on to make it look like I had facial hair and all that. Um, so it, it was, you know, yeah. So d there's male to female uh, erotic compulsions called auto uh, gynophilia. Auto gynophilia, yeah. Yeah. Um, know quite a bit about that. Yeah. So, and pardon me, and answer however you want to do. Was that an erotic feeling, or was it an aesthetic feeling? Like, how how did it feel like? dressing up like a man and producing yourself like did, did you feel like courage did you what was the like the emotional content it honestly it felt normal more than anything um huh. there's absolutely no eroticism to it i've i've actually looked into auto androphilia a little bit um you can find some of you can find much more of it on tumblr than anywhere else there's like a small community of it um i find it like interesting i'm a pretty open-minded person so i can i can relate to like the, the sex appeal of things probably better than most people can. So I can understand why people would be into that. But for me, no, there's absolutely no erotic appeal to being a man mm. whatsoever. For me, it's yeah. just like, that's like the standard for me. It's like, that's me when I'm normal. If I'm dressing as a woman um, or presenting femininely, that's like the exception. And that's like the, the costume I'm putting on. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, but your erotic attraction to females physically introduced itself before uh, attraction to males. Yes. You said definitely. something about bad pictures and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. And so you would not, you didn't want to be the object of your own desire. Not you at all. You were attracted to women. Yeah, absolutely. And was there, what was the stance towards homosexuality in your upbringing? Uh, it was bad. I mean, sinful, you know, it's, it's not a good thing at all. Like that's kind of what we were taught. Um, I did come out as a lesbian for a little bit. My mom cried. It was a, uh, it was pretty difficult. Um, obviously being the oldest, I'm the first one for everything. So, you know, if I'm the, mm. if I'm gay, the then first that's like the first gay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, exactly. <laughs> and, um, for the longest time I thought, cause I was like a very butch lesbian. I would even say like stone butch because, uh, I mean, you know, obviously I don't want to get too graphic with it, but, uh, um, 
giving pleasure for me was always much easier than receiving. Um, that was something I, I found would give me panic attacks. There were times I almost passed out when they tried, you know? Hmm. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, for the longest time, I thought, oh, that's why I've always felt more masculine. And that's why I've always wanted to, you know, be a boy. I'm just a butch lesbian. And there was this, like, um, this misunderstanding because then I met another butch lesbian and I would make the jokes with her that I was that I would always make with myself. It's like, oh, LOL, you look like a boy. Isn't that like funny? Hello, like, you know, isn't that hilarious? And she didn't like that. She was like, it actually makes me very uncomfortable. Could you please stop? <laughs> I was like, oh, my bad. I thought that was just like, I thought that was the collective experience that I was having with them is like, this is just what it was. Turns out it wasn't. Um, mm -hmm. Because apparently that's, you know, as it turns out, butch lesbians still love being women. So, you know, who'd have thought, but mm -hmm. um, that's kind of, I think that started to give me some insight that there might be something more going on. And um, it wasn't really until I uh, educated myself a little bit more on what gender dysphoria actually was. And that's kind of when it hit me like a truck when I was like, oh, this explains me now. Um, but the what term... Could you explain that? What does that mean? Yeah. Or so, did it I mean, I, I learned like growing up that trans people are delusional. They, uh, they think that there's something they're not. And um, it's a mental illness that they try and fix with, you know, hormones and surgery or whatever. And later on, I find out that there's actually a lot of people that do think that way. Um, and that's why this is so complicated and confusing, because there is a different description of gender dysphoria that I had heard that matched me much more, um, which is not like I think I'm something else, but there's just something mismatched, you know, that like. I, I think like a guy, I act like a guy, I get along more with guys and girls, I like dressing like one, and, you know, I would I would often get mistaken as a boy, like, in childhood and then, you know, into adulthood, and I always, I, I never had a problem with that, it just felt like the more normal way to uh, refer to me, you know, hmm. and then um, when I found out that that usually is a way to handle, you know, this thing called gender dysphoria, um, that's when I thought, well, maybe I can... I guess um, maybe I can resolve some of these like internal issues by transitioning, you know, um, the, the thing with gender dysphoria for me was that I often hear about this like visceral hatred towards your body. And later down the line that I started feeling that, but for the most part, I did not have that like hatred or vitriol towards like the way I looked in the mirror, for example, I just kind of saw nothing. It was like a very, it was almost like I was looking at a blob of, of nothingness, you know? I didn't really feel anything. I didn't feel love or hatred. I know my, my sister, you know, while she was going through puberty, she had a lot of like, uh, you know, self image issues and stuff, which I've heard is, you know, very normal for girls. I never had any of that. I, I was just like, I don't really see myself at all. Um, the, was it disassociation? Disassociation? Disassociation. I, I can't really say for sure. I mean, maybe it was, but you never know if the disassociation is like a coping mechanism with dysphoria. You know, I, I would say that there, I did spend a lot of my like adolescence disassociated, but uh, who knows why, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I remember one time looking in the mirror. I, <laughs> it's funny. I used to watch, um, I used to watch some YouTubers who were homosexual or there one guy, especially Tyler Oakley. He used to be very famous. I was never like a fan of his videos, but I copied his fashion style. I would like button my shirt up all the way to the top, you know, I had to wear like a snapback and all that. And, you know, look, look very tomboyish. I think I was about 15 years old. I looked at myself in the mirror and I, I started tearing up because it was just like, I don't know what I'm looking at right now. Like everything about me is just like, it, it feels like a Frankenstein's monster of just like different parts kind of stoned together, you know? Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it, the, that, that would only get stronger if I were to present feminine. Um, yeah. the, the beauty of being born female is that you can use your looks to get what you want. Um, so if I had a job interview that came in handy, you know, I would just like dress pretty and, you know, try and be as charming as I can, but it was very much like a costume for me, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so when, you know, some sometimes people say, oh, they're, they're donning womanhood as a costume or manhood as a costume. It's like, ironically for me, dressing more in line with my sex was the costume. So mm -hmm. yeah. It's Did you have a, a stable sense of self, uh, like who you were or something, or was it just your no. body was what was mismatched, but did you also, the whole thing kind of was like a, a mismatch. So there was definitely like a, a conflicted sense of self as well. Um, I would often tell my parents, like, I don't know who I am, you know, um, a lot of times, like 
this is the weirdest part. I still like think about this sometimes. Like, I don't even know if I have an answer to this, but there are times where I would think about like a, a future job prospect and I was like, yeah, but it's, it just seems kind of like weird for me to do it as a woman. And for so I don't know why that was like a sticking point for me is like, oh, but if I became a web developer or comedian or any, you know, any of the like pipe dreams you have as a kid, it's like, yeah, but as a woman, it just would feel weird for me to do. Um, <laughs> I can't really, yeah, I can't really describe that, like, in any of this, it's like, I have no explanation for why, I don't know, like, I think some people might say it's internalized sexism or whatever, but I, I don't have any, like, sexist feelings towards those roles that women fill, you know, that's mm -hmm. the thing, it just felt, it was like, only for me would it feel weird, it's not weird when anybody else does it, you know. There's something about what you said about the music down the street that you're describing, by describing yeah. how disassociated you were from your body, but also from your sense of self. Um, yeah. Have you done much in the way of psychotherapy or therapeutic stuff? Yeah, I, I see a therapist. I've seen her for a while. Um, I came out to her uh, as trans and, you know, we've continued sessions since then. She's not like a trans specific therapist, which I really like. Um, I usually try to stay away from anything like super LGBT oriented just because I, I feel like they're biased. I don't really want to trust what they say. Um, but the the sense of self thing was interesting because transitioning was one of the biggest things I ever did for myself. Um, one thing that I think had a lot to do with the like disrupted identity as a kid was my mother was extremely stressed out with you know the kids schooling them all and you know she had her own you know anxieties and that kind of thing she was working through. So um, I remember maybe like 14, 13, 14 years old. I told my mom like. I don't matter. The only thing that matters to me is my family and my schoolwork. So I, I kind of abandoned myself like pretty early on for the sake of like, you know, fulfilling responsibilities around the house, being there for the kids. Um, you know, my two, my two brothers, I have three brothers total, but the two older ones um, as kids, they were very like unruly, very, very ADHD bouncing off the walls all the time, you know, great kids. I, I love them to death. Um, but it was, it was like a, a handful, you know, um, especially when you have them all in the house all the time, you know, so I took on a lot of the like caretaking responsibilities and stuff. And so I attribute a lot of that to what probably disturbed my sense of identity, um, because it seemed like when I left the house and I kind of struck out on my own, um, <laughs> slowly, that stuff all kind of seemed to resolve itself, you know? Oh, okay. Well, you had more yeah, space. Yeah. To exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And just how isolated were you guys? What was your pipeline to the outside world? Mainly church. Uh, so Sundays okay. were uh, like a social thing, just yeah. as much as they were a religious thing. Um, we we were part of this program called Mother of Divine Grace Homeschooling. It was like a curriculum. You could buy the books online. Um, a lot of times moms uh, who were whose kids were also in the program, they would volunteer to do online classes. This was way before Zoom or anything like that. So we had to use like some sort of Adobe software to mm -hmm. get it up and running. But it would work very much like a live stream where the, you know, kids would type in the chat if they had questions or whatever. And then we would just sit and listen to lectures. They also had like an online forum that you could kind of connect with other people on. Um, and so that was like a big social thing for us was like through the online spaces that were you know, available for homeschoolers at the time that were, you know, not, they weren't Facebook or Twitter or anything. So you weren't really exposed to like too many outside ideas, okay. but you could, you know, connect with other Catholic kids. And how siloed was, was that from the rest of the internet? Um, I would say quite, I mean, we would have to ask our parents if we wanted to make an Instagram, they wouldn't, I, I didn't even really have social media until I was 16. Um, okay. my, biggest connection to like you know what was going on out on the outside was probably youtube as far as just like secular run-of-the-mill what's going on in the world type thing um pop culture what have you um i think uh i i don't even i think i didn't even have like a an iphone until college until then i used like an uh, like an ipod touch or whatever and okay. obviously you need wi-fi so i was pretty restricted on my access to that stuff for quite some time sure. So you didn't get yeah. deeply delved into Tumblr at an early age? No, <laughs> no. Okay. I did have a Tumblr for a while, but I was, I, I've always been like edgy and, and kind of like rebellious. And as far as I really don't care what other people are doing in the world, like I'm never going to follow trends. I think I was more of the person they thought they were smarter than they really were for being against whatever was trendy. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it's like a different type of trend, but 
uh yeah i was always i've always been very very critical of like you know anything that's just because other people are doing it doesn't mean i have to do it you know what i mean my mom instilled that in me at at a very early age my little edge lord <laughs> yeah exactly and how did uh when did you first come across the idea of transition Ah, oh, that's a hard one. I want to say it was some sort of stupid BuzzFeed video. Um, it's like, uh, I don't even remember exactly what it was about, but it must have been, I, 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 geez, that's like so hard to answer. The, the thing that made it initially click for me before I repressed it all was there was this video by, uh, that actress Ruby Rose. Um, who's, she identifies as gender fluid. Well, I guess it's they identify as gender fluid, but, um, she had done like a video where she goes from like very feminine, like looking like a woman to completely transforming into like a very masculine person, you know, with like the, you know, strap, mm. whatever, you know, all of it, the whole nine. Um, and that was the first time I had seen that like represented. And I was like, oh, it's possible. Like you can just do that. You can just change that way, you know? Um, she obviously there's no hormones or, or surgeries represented in that video it was purely just like social transition, I guess is what they call it. Yeah. Um, and I really connected with that and it, it gave me like a lot of conflicting feelings of just like, well, what am I? Cause this like resonates with me so much, but, uh, um, you know, I don't understand why I feel that way. You know, um, I also remember when I was, I was at some like roller skating rink once as a kid and these two people came up to me. And they were like, you look awesome. You look amazing. Obviously, like I had short hair. I had cargo pants on. I was like very tomboyish looking. So they asked me what my pronouns were. First time I had ever heard that in my life. And uh, <laughs> um, I, I just I just blankly said, like, I don't know. Um, because at that point, I had kind of heard about those concepts. And I, ha I had been like struggling with that. But the fact that I said, I don't know, and that I like, you know, identified myself as somebody who was, you know, confused about their gender kind of sent me into a panic because i was like oh no i don't want these people to think i'm like something i'm not i don't want people i don't want to be like dragged into something just because like hmm. you know i don't even understand myself how can i tell other people what i am you know what i mean yeah yeah uh without them getting the wrong idea or anything um so later on i told them oh i'm a, I'm a girl haha <laughs> like lol just kidding um and i talked to my mom about it and she said this is all bullshit it's all nonsense like don't listen to them you're a girl it's perfectly fine you're great the way you are don't don't listen to it. And so I kind of um, like, I guess, internally and externally, I lashed out at kind of like what I thought the transgender movement was at the time. Um, and I'm kind of grateful for that, because I think keeping this like, critical stance of mine, you, you know, kind of in the back of my head is like, I don't like, there's other options for people this is like, you know, how do I put it? you don't have to be trans, right? Like pe not everybody has to be trans if they have like gender identity issues, you know? Um, it, again, it's just like, it worked out for me, but um, keeping that kind of like critical feeling, I think helped because it prevented me from uh, uh, get succumbing to too much peer pressure down the line when I did get more involved with the trans community and all that. So, okay. yeah. How did that ramp up towards that? You, you left home i suppose went to college and well i, I because i went to a community college i kind of lived at home for that um what kind of happened is that one of my brothers and my mom um were they did not get along um they there was like constant fighting in the house um i was working i i think at that point i was working two jobs uh i wasn't in school anymore and then on top of that dealing with like my uh, homosexuality at the time um, in that environment, it was very, very difficult. And there was like a lot going on. Um, so I, I had gotten involved in like a, like music group. I, I used to, I'm a hip hop fan. Um, and I found like a, a group of people who like, you know, they do ciphers together and they rap and all that. And I become plugged into that. And one of my friends through that group didn't have a place to stay. And I was like, well, I don't want to be at home anymore. So I'll just be homeless with you, you know? Um, and so I let him, you know, sleep in my car with me. We, you know, it was quite an adventurous time. It was, it felt like I was finally free. You know, I kind of just escaped. I'd ran away and I was just living the way I wanted to live. You know, it was a, you know, smoking whatever I wanted to, uh, obviously nothing more than weed, but you know, being able mm -hmm. to do that with, with leisure. And, um, it was, it was definitely a time for sure. Uh, stressful, 
It was the middle of the summer, and my car was nothing but leather seats, so it was very hot <laughs> to sleep in. But <laughs> I, I was so fatigued at times that I would like fall asleep on the road on my way to work. Um, oh, no. So it was, it was very tough. The fact that I did that without testosterone is like insane to me. Um, hmm. But like, I mean, it was a great learning experience. And then eventually, I found an apartment. And after that, things just kind of nothing really gender related happened until I left the music group and I got more online. Um, obviously, not only do more trans people live on the internet, but there's also more information about transsexuality and transgenderism on the internet. Um, so that was a big resource. It, it, it's funny because it sounds like rapid onset gender dysphoria, but it definitely wasn't rapidly onset. I can tell you that much. It was just, I just got yeah. the education part from the internet, you know? Yeah. But, and what were the, what was it that you had to think through? options wise and then consequences wise well i um for the longest time i didn't want to acknowledge it at all and i was like i'll this is just a phase i'll let it pass you know and i'll i'll uh, i'll go back to you know not feeling anything about my body whatsoever and then it kind of escalated into like kind of a heated conversation with my partner where he just said like you keep talking about it you're clearly distressed by it to some degree um you might as well give it a shot, you know, do the social transition and see how that goes. And um, at least then there are no consequences, you know, physically, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I So I, I was like, okay, I'll give it a shot. Slowly kind of, you know, cut my hair, you know, started changing the way I dressed back to, it was, it was much less about like a radical wardrobe change and just kind of going back to basics because that's how I'd, I had always dressed. And then for a while, you know, like I would dabble in the in the feminine and then it would never work. I would always kind of go back to the masculine way of dressing. Uh, so it kind of was like just resetting back to normal. And then I waited about seven months before I started any sort of hormones because I really wanted to make sure that I was making the right decision with it. Um, obviously, testosterone hits you quite hard once you start. Um, and I, you know, researched about like potential negative side effects, you know, what it's going to do to me. Um, and I, I was like, well, I know the risks, so I have only myself to blame if this doesn't turn out and I'm fine with that. And, hmm. you know, yeah. It's fascinating that there's a third person, well, a second person involved, a, a partner who to some degree, one assumes you guys are connected through attraction and yeah. attraction is modeled on kind of a binary, like guys kind of, if you're heterosexual you're attracted to women and right. women adorn themselves in a way to hyper you know uh hyper feminize themselves and if you if your partner starts to shift in from the target like does the attraction follow like is that something to navigate um but this is this is somebody else we're talking about but it's just an interesting complication for sure um i think part of the explanation that helps is probably that we're both bisexual so appearances it's like you know if you're hot you're hot you know so so it's like hmm. uh, i think what dro drove us together much more than anything is that we were both in incredibly similar life situations when we met which was actually through covid um i started at working at the grocery store that he was working at and so we would just start having like longer and longer conversations together um, and it was like the first time either of us had found somebody that would listen to the other person and that actually knew what the other person was saying. Um, sometimes I wonder if a degree of autism might have been involved there where it's like we were the first person that like, truly got it. Um, but we had both kind of just put distance between ourselves and old friend groups. We were both struggling with family. We were both very bitter towards the world, uh, very much like, you know, screw the government, screw everybody, screw society. We're just going to live out on a farm one day, you know? Um, and then, <laughs> you know, since then, it's just been like, we've, we've kind of like matured and grew up together in a way. And I think that's hmm. been the bond more than anything. Wow. Um, the sexual attraction, while initially there, it, for me was, for especially for men, was always like, you're attractive from like an analytical sense, right? Like, yeah, by, by, by like the standards of society, you know, you could cat you would be considered attractive, you know? Um, there are things about him that I really liked, and I think that is because there are some features about him that are, like, a little bit more feminine. Hmm. Um, he's also way more empathetic than, you know, most guys that I've met, that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, I mean, I, I don't know. It just, like, works out really well for us. We, well. I think we both understand sexuality and, and attraction in, like, a different way. 
um, we're both like pretty into like you know the kink community and that kind of stuff. So there's like a definitely like a different level of like understanding of like what sex is and the psychology behind it and that kind of thing. I, sorry, I hope that's uh that makes sense and all that. It's um it's a hmm. rabbit hole for sure. But <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's if he transitioned, if I mean, would do you think that you would follow your target attraction would follow? Or oh that yeah, would for sure. Even be more attractive to you. If he... I've told him that if he were ever to do the same thing I were to do and transition, I would love him all the same. You know, like okay. he's him. He's his personality. Um, the the brain behind the the, the face like never changes. You know, so hmm. I, I would support him, of course. Um, I, it's it's actually funny. I think if he had been raised in like a different time. I feel like people would have probably pressured him to, into it or tried to pressure him into it. He's a very like strong headed person. Like he's, we both have that like streak of like individuality. So I don't think he would have been, been pressured into it, but I think people would have definitely tried. Hmm. Hmm. Um, unfortunately, I think that the, the pressures probably like, especially to take hormones probably exist more for males than for females. Um, so yeah, I, I think like he would have been more likely to be pressured than I would have, you know, how was but. testosterone been? When did it's you start? Great. How long ago? Uh, December 2022. So okay. it's been about like a year and a half now. Um, it's been amazing. It, it felt like it felt like a, um, kind of being like pushed into my own body for the for the first time. And like you know, like I said before, like the sensory experiences all seemed to matter more to me. Suddenly, I had likes, I had dislikes, I had I, I cared about things I liked. I cared about staying away from things I didn't like beforehand it was all kind of like i was numb and it was like yeah whatever it doesn't really matter how i dress doesn't really matter uh you know what i like or dislike i there's for the longest time i couldn't tell people what my hobbies were it's like i had no interests or anything um the only way i was able to have an interest was if i would be getting like some sort of social gratification from it so if i were if i had friends i would want to do what my friends did and that would kind of dictate my interests and since transitioning, it's like I've been able to realize I like drawing. I actually like to write uh, um, something I used to do a lot. And then I've started picking it up again. You know, my yeah. my uh, sense of uh, taste in music, it was like I, I'm, I'm able to relate to songs more now and stuff like I hear music and it's like, wow, that actually really speaks to me. That's first time that's ever happened. I never got that when, it, when I was living as a woman. It's like I would never feel like anything really related to me. Hmm. Um, and I. I I feel like part of it is just that when you have like a mismatched identity, it's like you're trying to relate to stuff, but you don't know you don't know that you're the the you that is trying to relate. You know, like there's there's a mismatch with yourself that makes it difficult for you to uh, uh, fully say, "Oh, this speaks to me," because like you don't know what that who that me is. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. it's just it's odd with this particular um, phenomena, psychological phenomena. It's like there's a drug aspect to it and then there's an identity aspect to it. And somehow, somehow those are paired. If there was a drug that made you feel the same way, but you didn't have to deal with the identity aspect, would you take that over transition? I would definitely consider it. Uh, I mean, I think, um, I think for me reading up on like the history of masculine females, definitely gave me some insight that I didn't realize I needed even. If you ever are interested, there's a book called Female Masculinity. I can actually grab it off mm. my shelf, but um, the name of the author is Jack Halberstrom, I want to say. It's, it's a very complicated last name. But if you look up Female Masculinity, I'm sure it'll come up. It, I think it's the only book I've found that actually takes a closer look at, like, the relationship between females and you know masculinity overall now obviously the book is probably what i would classify as like somewhat woke so there's some stuff about there about like a, a cisgender heteronormative society etc whatever you can kind of choose for yourself how much you want to like buy into that aspect of it but as far as like the history of like women who are or i should say females who were born uh, um, with abnormalities that would make them less feminine uh, or make them appear less feminine for society standards at the time. And like, what do you do with those women? You know, uh, back <laughs> then, obviously, there's far less options. And there's another book called The Well of Loneliness. Um, granted, my, my knowledge on these, like on history and all that is like very limited. So I can't, I'm going to like stick to what I know. Uh, um, yeah. And you can kind of like look at the rest. But 
from what I understand, The Well of Loneliness was a book that was supposed to represent a butch lesbian. It was written in like the 20s or 30s, which apparently was a time when feminist and gender discussions were, you know, quite popular. Um, and apparently it was very controversial because feminists and lesbians did not relate to it. Um, and they said, this is not how a woman loves a woman. This is how a man loves a woman. Hmm. Um, and the book featured, like the, the main character in the book was a girl. I wanted to say her name was Steven. She was, uh, um, the story basically goes, I haven't finished it. The story basically goes, parents are very excited. They're having a baby and they want it to be a boy. And it's like, oh my God, we're going to name him Steven. He's going to be like amazing, whatever. They make all these plans. Baby's born, it's a girl. Um, but from the moment that the baby's born, the parents both feel like there's something off about her and they decide, screw it. We're still going to name her Steven. Uh, Steven grows up and she does, she just like her, her body is shaped differently. She's got broader shoulders. She has no interest in anything feminine. Her father at a very early age, like realizes she's never going to be able to find success or, or acceptance as a woman. So I'm going to raise her as a man to my, to the best of my ability. So her whole life, she basically is raised as a man but see it still like talk to and you know like her pronouns are she her and all that so she's still a woman you know and especially the early life uh, um to up to the point that i that i stopped reading because i was reading a bunch of other stuff um i it was like the most eye-opening experience for me i was like this is exactly how i felt as a kid you know mm -hmm. um to the like to the T of like, there is a, there's a guy in the book that feels threatened by her because he sees her as competition instead of like, you know, a, an object of desire, you know? And I, fe I, I remember feeling like that around other guys sometimes where it was like, I felt like either I was, I, I felt threatened by them or they felt threatened by me to a certain degree. Obviously, maybe I'm just like talking myself up too much and said, yeah, I was, you know, more masculine than I really was. But like, yeah, hmm. I, I mean, that is kind of how I felt about uh, um, girls and boys at the times. Like I never related to, to girls and all that. And that's, pretty well featured in that book so i hope i'm not rambling i i wanted to say something about um your question i forgot what it was i'm so sorry the, just the uh, just that this um i guess what, what's it called like, this treatment is both a chemical treatment and an yes. identity treatment i remember what what where i was going with all that so basically saying all that to say that i think that there are some women that are born with more testosterone in their body and that can probably be like a, a cause of gender dysphoria for some. Um, I watched, I, I don't remember his name, but I watched your uh, interview with that um, sexologist. Uh, I can't remember what his name was, but well, he Michael had kind Bailey of gone or... into, it wasn't Michael Bailey, it was another one. Uh, Michael Ray Bailey was interesting Blanchard or well. J uh, James Cantor, I think. It might have been him. Cantor. Um, and Zucker, he, I've also had Zucker. Yeah, the, whoever it was, they went into like how homosexuality and even transgenderism to a degree are really determined by like how much testosterone or estrogen you receive at birth and considering like when i look at you know my body from like back then or when i think about how i felt around other you know kids i did feel like like broader shouldered bigger hands bigger feet like um i always felt very clunky around other girls um and for the longest time you know i just chalked that up to well you know that's just my toxic body standards you know coming into into play mm -hmm. that i'm comparing yeah. myself to these girls and i feel different um and i don't know i mean it just kind of stuck around and i've always felt that way you know around other women's like i was never really one of them you know um so i think there's like a biological aspect to that that testosterone can correct for some essentially yeah. I, have you been otherwise healthy with regard to your female reproductive system and endometriosis, anything like that? Or uh... no. So I used to have like uh, very, um, very horrible cycles. Uh, that's pretty much the only health concern, and it wasn't even really treated. I went on birth control for a little bit, and then obviously I started tea, so I got off of it. Um, hmm. But it would be like severe mood swings um, to the point of like suicidality at times, and um, like. The, the cramping symptoms could be anything from like mild pain to like I was doubled over the counter at my job, you know, because it was so bad. Um, and then it would be like four or five days of like very heavy bleeding and then it'd be over, you know. Wow. Um, and the, the actual period of it off, uh, actually was like the best part because that was a sign that was going to be over soon. But like it would be a hellish experience. Um, mm -hmm. And birth control definitely helped with that. Uh, but it didn't 
fix everything obviously um yeah. the best thing really has been testosterone so far when uh, sorry when did you start uh, with your menstruation menstrual cycle um, i want to say i was probably like 12 or 13 okay and did that did the severity of that contribute to your gender dysphoria um i really can't say it it, it felt like a force inside of me that i could not control um yeah. Interestingly enough, like I have a very strange relationship with crying because I would cry all the time, um, even when I didn't want to. It was like again, it was one of those things that just like kind of started and I had no control over it. Um, and it felt like I shouldn't be crying. This is nothing even to cry about, but it would just happen. It was kind of same with like the the menstrual cycles and everything. Like the the hormonal fluctuations during those times must have been. I'm assuming that was what was causing like the serious mood swings. Because I mean, like the the things that would trigger it were so dumb. Like the the one I remember the most, like the most vividly, was like we didn't have potato chips, and that upset me so much that it just like caused like a chain reaction in my brain. And I I was like by the end of the night I was like like a mess in my bed crying. Um, my sister came to the rescue. She said, "No, you wanted potato chips. Let's go to the store. We'll go get some together. We'll just talk. Whatever." She 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 she, she saved my ass that night. But. Um, yeah, I mean, there was like a lot of moments like that where it's like, you know, I would be in distress and I would always tell people, oh, you know, it's just my period or whatever. But like that was mo mostly an assumption because of how bad it would be. Yeah, but I mean, that just uh, that adds to this sense of uh, self or this lack of sense of self. If your self is changing so much, you can't have a stable sense of. It's a good point. Yeah, it's kind of upsetting. Yeah, good, obs good observation there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then how did uh, testosterone um help you with your relationship to that part of your physical experience and then just your body as a whole honestly like the it the emotional regulation that came with testosterone has been like super helpful um i i have very few mood swings if any at all usually it's like mild sadness which i i, I chalk up to like you know the estrogen that's still in my body you know fluctuating because i you know i still have my like uterus and everything um so that's usually what i what i assume it is and it's much more predictable and way 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 more manageable i mean it's like it's night and day difference um i don't think you know my parents have not been like the happiest about me taking testosterone but um i don't think even they would be able to deny that my emotions have been much more stable since getting on it um mm. i haven't asked them but i would assume like it, it, everyone i talk to seems to notice a difference so yeah yeah, yeah for sure did transition, did one of the things you have to think about is sacrificing your relationship to your family? I, I, I was worried about that. Um, I, I actually consider myself to be incredibly lucky. They flat out said, you know, we see you as our daughter. You're always going to be our daughter. Um, and hmm. I told them I'm fine with that. I, I've, I've, from the beginning, I said, I do not expect you to like change your image of me i don't want you to call me any pronoun that you're uncomfortable calling me like they've done so much for me uh in my life that you know mm. despite our ups and downs together it's like i would never uh i would never cut ties with them over that sort of thing it's just not something i'm willing to do a lot of people have told me no they should definitely respect you like you should stand up for yourself it's like i have stood up for myself like my one condition for them was don't don't treat me like there's something wrong with me and don't uh, um don't attribute this to some sort of mental disorder because they they ask for my insight quite a bit. I give my insight to them quite a bit on like other issues and topics or just life stuff. And it's like if you call me mentally ill, you're to a degree you're undermining everything else that I that I say that you guys do take to heart. You know, hmm. you can't listen to a mentally ill person's advice. That's just the way I see it. You know, because you don't know where I'm coming from. So hmm. if you want me to keep giving giving input, just let's just uh, uh chalk this up to like a big question mark but let's not say that i'm mentally ill or anything like that because that that's the one thing that kind of bothered me and my my mom was like you know what we we want to preserve our relationships so cool you know we'll do that okay so it's yeah. worked out since it's been great I, i'm so lucky because so many people lose their families over it and it, it can be a point of fighting so yeah. the fact that i can be who i am and still come home and be what i what i need to be for them and what you know I, without like them, I, I think that the physical changes bother them to a degree, but you know, clearly they still see me for who I am and, and that's all I've ever wanted. So yeah, mm -hmm. I'm very grateful for that. Well, I mean, it helps a lot to uh, proceed with or lead with respect, mutual respect. Yeah, so. absolutely.
Um, and there's some people that I told them that I was trans and that I was going to live as a guy and they never talked to me again, but you know, that's their prerogative. I, I hold no spite to them, uh, you know, spite against them. I, I I'm not going to be mad at them for that. It makes me laugh more than anything. Cause a lot of times they'll be like, Oh, I'm, I'm really glad we can have these respectful discussions. And then they never talk to me again. <laughs> so it's mm. like, mm. but you know what? Everybody's got their boundaries. I'm here to respect boundaries all the time. So, you yeah. know, no problem with it. Yeah. Mm how what kind of uh physical changes have most surprised you or um most well, enjoyed you, you or pleased you i guess <laughs> the uh, body hair is like the first thing that kind of starts um and it, it hits all at once it was a it was probably the hardest thing for me to get used to but wasn't it, it didn't even take me that long to to kind of just accept well you know this is the way i'm going to be so you know it I would try and, you know, continue shaving my legs. And then after like, I think a month, I was like, there's no point in this. It's just going to grow back like by the next day. So we'll just leave it how it is, you know, um, mm -hmm. voice definitely is like, you know, it's a gradual decline and like, you know, you get deeper and deeper as, as yeah. time goes. Yeah. Um, facial hair is obviously it's very pathetic as you can see. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it's hopefully it'll grow in over time. But, um, other than that, like I think the body fat distribution has been the hardest, thing to kind of achieve but you start hitting the gym and that starts happening you know very quickly okay. i work out like about three times a week um and it's a that's an incredible experience I th i'd say for anybody who wants to uh transition from female to male hitting the gym is a must like you got to do it it's going to help you in every way shape and form <laughs> like yeah one um i want to say danger of the path of transition is that in order to fix yourself you hyper fixate on yourself. So I'm wondering, you, you kind of described like going from being disassociated to in yourself. Is there a balance that you f feel that you've struck? And also you're rather young, so that that's going to change over time as well. Our ego sure. kind of stops being so tight, um, <laughs> usually uh, as we yeah. age and gain responsibilities. I think that, um, Honestly, I think like my family situation and the the family I have now um, that I've I've sort of you know dated or married into, however you want to put it, has mm -hmm. definitely kind of been an anchor for that, and it's kind of forced me to realize like, well, this can't all be about me, no matter what anybody says. Um, I think there's definitely been I've definitely gone to the extreme of like being too self-sacrificial, and I have always been very concerned about going too far into the other. Uh, end of things um especially like early on in, in my relationship um and with my you know in-laws and everything there was like a, a very selfish part of me that's like i don't want to give up my lifestyle you know um yeah. i want to keep being like you know free and and doing whatever i want you know there there's a lot of sacrifices that do come with a relationship but um for me honestly like i, I met somebody that they're worth you know sacrificing um but i think that all those things have kind of led sorry somebody's walking in real quick but i think all of those things have sort of like uh, um kind of kept me grounded and it's actually been a big blessing for me um mm -hmm. it, when it comes to m not getting too focused on me and myself and i all the time yeah yeah you know um it's just having other people around you that you do care for and that you do feel a responsibility for really helps you remember that it's not all about you and um it can be a, a, a great thing sometimes because you know sometimes you hit a roadblock with yourself and then you can focus on someone else's problems for a while. And it's, it's yeah. nice to have that, that person there. Um, I think every, I, I honestly, I'm, I'm not in anybody else's head, so I can't say like how much other people think about themselves. I definitely analyze myself quite a bit. Um, cause when there's things that I don't understand that I'm going through, like, obviously I want to fix them. But, um, when you say that there's a, a big focus on the self in the transgender, like with the, with the, trans transition process i'm guessing you mean more like on physical appearances or is it just like the ego and the self uh all together i just think that if you are proceeding down a road that has an infinite amount of possible body modifications your attention can get stuck on your That's secondary true. characteristics um, but also your mentality that. can contribute to that I've met some trans people like both in real life and on the internet where I, that would be definitely a criticism I have of them um, where it's like they get really fixated on their appearances and like how people refer to them. And it's, 
it's almost less about like improving themselves and it's more about controlling how other people see them you know which is like the something you hear a lot in, in media is that you know these people want to want everybody else to bend to their delusion um whether i would call it a delusion or not uh, i i probably wouldn't uh i'd say there's something else going on but it, there is this like fixation on controlling other people's behavior towards them and that's i have a big problem with that i don't think that that's healthy and i think it's like a losing battle period um mm -hmm. it, especially for i mean <laughs> especially for me as a man in the movement um that's something i i've had to come to terms with recently it's just like they're not going to listen to me i'm a man uh, i'm masculine they don't care about that so i i this is actually one of the reasons i wanted to reach out to you is because you seemed like one of the people that indiscriminately listens so mm. <laughs> that was like something i appreciated but mm. yeah yeah i do um, what i can <laughs> what about babies i have never wanted children no ever never wanted ever since i was a kid or even no a kid. yeah Ever since I was a kid, I was like, uh, "Mom, I, uh, I've helped take care of yours. I'm done." <laughs> like, oh, okay, <laughs> interesting. Yeah, yeah. And she's got spares, uh, so grandkids are not <laughs> yeah. been shut off from her, right? Exactly, exactly. You know, uh, I think um, I definitely want nieces and nephews. I am not like one of those people that's like, "Ew, children are terrible." You know, disgusting little freaks, like little monsters that destroy everything. I've never really had that that feeling towards them. It's just. I think that I would be ill-equipped to be a parent, um, and I think I, I have too many ambitions in life that I like too many boxes I haven't checked off the bucket list that I still want to get done before I would ever consider being re that responsible for a child. Um, hmm. Especially like you know I, I've I'm a true crime person. Sometimes I enjoy watching like interrogations and that kind of thing. And it's like you see the the consequences of child neglect and, and of like hurting a child it, it can be devastating to them it's like i would never want to do that to a kid you know but if i volunteer you know for a boys and girls club or you know become a camp counselor during the summertime when i'm a little older and I've, I've got more time for it i wouldn't be against it i'm still still wouldn't mind being a positive influence on on children you know mm. obviously not gender related stuff but just like as a role model or whatever i'm cool with that yeah you know when you look yeah. at yourself in 60 years do you see an old man yeah i do What's he doing? Uh, probably complaining about kids these days and their damn phones or something like that. But, <laughs> and, uh, no, they got no work ethic anymore or something like that. But yeah. I, I don't know. I think I would have a garden. I, I think I'd probably have a library and uh, an art room, you know, and I would just be doing this similar stuff that I'm doing now. Just I would probably have more time for it, you know. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. And how has your faith changed? Um. I really can't go to church um, or engage too seriously in like a strict religious uh, um, guideline. I can't really go within like Ceremony. somebody else's version of the faith. You know, okay. uh, last time I really went to church and took it seriously, it kind of ended up in me having like a mental breakdown. Hmm. Um, and too many I contradictions. I wouldn't say contradictions. It was more like I had like this fear at the time that I might be pregnant. And I got like so panicked about it that I was like, when I was sitting in church, I was like, what if this is God's punishment to me for like, you know, being bad or being like a sinful person? Mm -hmm. And I was like, what if I have to repent now for, for, in order for, you know, me to not be pregnant or whatever? It's just like a very irrational line of logic. Mm -hmm. um, and I've realized that like some religious stuff is just a trigger for that. So I just I try and stay away from it in that respect. Mm -hmm. um, but judgment I still. Yeah, but I still love, like, you know, everything in the Gospels is just, like, absolutely based, in my opinion. Like, it's great. Um, mm -hmm. There's nothing in there that I can really argue against, uh, you know, love one another. Uh, gosh, there's so many. Uh, so many of the parables come in handy for me in my life nowadays. It's like, I really mm -hmm. fail to see what problems there are with what Jesus actually said. It seems like most of the time when people quote the Bible, they don't really quote Jesus. They quote other things in there you know i think that the actual stories of christ are awesome you know hmm. have no problem with them i think jesus is great love the guy you know <laughs> so yeah 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 did you ever feel like god set set you up to fail or god made a mistake with you i did once believe that and that was the closest i came to you know uh, committing suicide essentially yeah. um i was like that i remember telling my parents like i believe in god i believe that he exists but he must hate me if I've done all of this for him and I'm still miserable, you know? 
Um, and that was kind of me saying, like, look, I've followed all the rules. I've tried to live the best virtuous life I can. I've resisted, you know, uh, uh, temptations at times. And, you know, now I'm even trying to give up homosexuality. And it's like still not enough for you. You know, I'm still not happy. And that's all you promised was happiness. And mm. so uh, um, it made me kind of take a good look at myself and, uh, um, I, you know, after after I got out the hospital out of the mental institution that I got committed to and everything, I was I, I kind of had to like look at myself and just uh, um, kind of reassess how I was going about these expectations I had of God, you know, um, hmm. and it was like a slow flip around, you know. So now I the way I see it now is like God gives you a life and that's the biggest gift that anybody could be given. Why? Well, you have five senses you have emotions, you have a brain, and there's like a whole world out there. It's like you're spawned in a video game with like endless opportunities and endless things that you can possibly explore. And hmm. I think the gravest sin that anybody could commit is not exploring that. Um, which means that if it means doing something that the Bible says is wrong or that the church might say is wrong, if it's something that compels you and that you kind of need to learn or explore right i'd say it's better to do that than to not obviously you got to be rational about it if you're thinking about doing heroin probably don't you know it's <laughs> like that that can lead to serious outcomes but it's more it's more uh, um focusing the worship you you give god on um how you live your life and and living it to the fullest potential you can possibly live it to um and i would say that definitely played into my decision to transition because that's one of those things. It's like if I want to fully live my life, if this is a chance to do that, like I have to take it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So where where does transition end for you? When are you no longer transitioning? Um, probably like I want to. I, I obviously I want to get top surgery. That's one thing. Hysterectomy potentially, um, depending on like the health risks and stuff. I want to get a little bit more information on that and see how it works. Obviously, I think uh, after a certain point, you have to consider that as an option because like a, the testosterone can atrophy, atrophy. or you yeah. know, yeah. So if that's the case, then that's fine. Um, like I'll do it, and um, I would say probably at that point I'd be done transitioning. Uh, that's one of my criticisms. Is like the, my provider right now for for testosterone. They'll ask me like well, are there any other changes you want to see? And I'm like, this, that doesn't make any sense to me. This, this is something that helps me in so many more ways that like the physical aspect of it is almost like takes a back seat to like how much it's helped me in other ways. You know, it's like, what do you mean? What changes do I want to see? I want to see myself as a guy, you know, that's pretty much it. Like I saw the female version. It's like, now I'm going to see the male version and that's all I want. <laughs> like, you tell me if, if, do I look male enough? Then we're good. You know? Yeah. So yeah. Um, the, the whole like transitioning thing it's it, for me it's just like it's hormones that i take and it's operations i'm going to get and that's it you know and, mm -hmm. and then other than that you try and socially integrate yourself into society and that that's pretty much all you got to do you know what's your you know cost benefit analysis of being connected to a medical system for the rest of your life as a man it's it frustrating for sure. Um, I mean, I, I already rely on the medical system for like uh, um, ADHD medication and anxiety medication, that kind of thing. Um, and I've sometimes like when I'm at my worst. So like, granted, this is this is something I think when I'm full of emotion, it's not like a real reflection of my thoughts. Sometimes I'm just like, wow, I really am just like genetically inferior. I've got all these like screwed up things about myself and i'm just lucky enough to be born in a society where i can you know mm. gain access to help help myself through that you know so i definitely understand like the the concern of like well you're connected to the med medical system for the rest of your life um and i'm like aren't we all to a certain degree like we all kind of need the medical system at one point in our life or another um if it means that i get a prescription for testosterone for the rest of my life like cool you know nobody really needs to know except me um okay you know i, I definitely want to go stealth as much as I possibly can and just is that'll it, just be something uh, between me and my doctor. Is it a ordeal to re up your testosterone? Honestly, I think it it's my this might this is definitely gonna get me in trouble with some trans people. I think it should probably be a bit more of an ordeal in order to get access to that kind of stuff. I mean like you know, you show up to Planned Parenthood, they ask you a bunch of questions and then cool, here's your prescription. I'm just like uh, for for adults maybe fine if you you know informed consent all that um but 
it's definitely no, it's definitely not been an ordeal. Uh, it's been quite easy for me to gain access to all that stuff. So I mean, like yeah. injections and stuff like that, or is, I mean, is that a pain to have oh, to oh. be doing this stuff? Not really. It's like something I do once a week. You know, I actually did mine earlier this morning. Um, uh, obviously, I'm never going to forget it. It's pretty important to me. So, yeah, you just mm -hmm. pop it in there. You're done for the day, and then, you know. Yeah. See you next week. <laughs> yeah, is it? Um, I spoke with somebody who has a DSD, disorder of sexual development or intersex condition. He his oh, body has a problem producing testosterone, and now he takes it. And he says he he takes it once a week. And on you know Saturday night, uh, when he first takes it, he's eighteen year old, and then he ends he ends the week being about sixty, like with his testosterone, uh, the waveform. Uh, whereas really? my body is kind of like eking it out, like slowly uh, degrading over time. But, you know, it's more regulated because it's an integrated part of my system. I wonder if you feel that spike. Oh, kind I of wonder, cycle. I've, I've kind of thought about that. Um, I want to say there's a possibility I'm definitely more energetic, like the first couple of days. Um, as far as like the taper down, I've even heard this from some trans women where it's like they really feel it when they need to you know, take their estrogen injection again. And I'd say for me, I think if I don't take it by the end of the day, I'll feel it. But I think I, I, hmm. I'm keeping just enough of it in me that like, um, you know, I can, I can take my next dosage without really feeling too many consequences. But I do remember one day I had to take it late or actually there were a couple of days I had to take it later in the day because either needles hadn't shown up on time or I was out of a prescription at one point. And I definitely felt like the emotion starting to bubble up again, and I was feeling very tired. Um, so if I take it, you know, early Monday morning, I'm fine, you know. But other otherwise, yeah, you'll definitely start to to feel it pretty soon. Hmm. Um, what was your goal for reaching out to me? What like what what is the essence of what you want to communicate? So, I think that, you know, I obviously I've interacted with the trans community for. I'd say like a couple of years now online. Um, I've had different friend groups. I've gone in and out of them. There's been dramas that, you know, very silly. It doesn't really matter in the long run. Yeah. Um, but something that I realized very early on was the hyper fixation on femininity. Um, and to me, that's interesting because transitioning isn't just about being feminine. At least that's what I thought. You know, it's like some people want to transition to become more masculine, but it seems like they're only ever interested in affirming the feminine. Um, and this kind of launched me into this like rabbit hole uh, um, of like things that I would kind of explore and experience. And autogynophilia is a big part of it. Um, there's a very massive like sexual overtone to a lot of the feminized stuff that you see. Um, for a while on Twitter, like, you know, you know, considering the people I was following and the circles I was in, it was like nothing but pastel pink, no matter how much you scrolled. It's like everything was like pastels and like girly and like, you know, uh, uh, sexual lingerie and all that and and it was just like where are the trans guys like where are they there's none there's none to be found you know hmm. uh, obviously you can go on tumblr for some of it but even there it seems to be much smaller than like, well some maybe say. It could be maybe wrong. the trans men man up and log off that's i i literally think that is what the what the case is uh i think a lot of them just kind of start living normal lives and they they go off on their own my issue isn't like that oh you should be more online obviously like do your life my issue is that like when a lot of the advocacy comes from online spaces mm -hmm. and there's only ever a fixation on one side of it uh it leads to some really interesting phenomenons i've seen trans women that seem to hate trans men they seem to have like this like bitterness towards them whether it's like you have the body i want and now you're trying to take testosterone or whether it's um i see you as a woman because I secretly see myself as a cross-dressing man, so I'm going to be misogynistic towards you and try and shut you up. Because I, hmm. you know, uh, um, I think that like those kinds of like dynamics hold the trans community back, and I think it it it's causing a lot of problems in the long run. Let's say like childhood transition, for example. Hmm. The biggest argument I've seen in favor of childhood transition is that it prevents. Uh, young males who might be dysphoric from going through male puberty um, and then having a harder time passing later down in life. Well, that doesn't apply to trans men because you can hit, you can get on testosterone as a like young girl and you'll pass like in no time. Right. But should you get that as a young girl? Probably not because like a lot of, you see with the rapid onset gender dysphoria thing, um, 
you probably shouldn't get on t testosterone right away. You probably should give it some time and some thought because there are irreversible changes if you get on it, you know? Um, it's not like that with estrogen. There is like a l longer time it takes for you to kind of like start to become feminized. So you have a little bit more time if you change your mind, right? So there's already that bias there where it's like, this is a law that would help trans women, but it wouldn't necessarily help trans men. Another one is the, um, mm. uh, should trans women go to male prison or female prison, right? Well, the argument is if they go to male prison, they're at a higher risk of being sexually assaulted. Okay, let's say we put that law in, in effect, right? Let's say that now you go into the prison of your identified sex uh, or, or gender or whatever. That's not going to help trans men. In fact, probably there's a higher likelihood they would get assaulted in men's prison because they got the female uh, anatomy, you know, mm -hmm. which is what most of those men want. They just they, they use other men as like a, a surrogate, I guess, or it's like a substitute, you know. So uh, again, but but when you hear these conversations, it's always, well, trans women are going to get raped, so it has to be changed, right? Um, and so I started noticing that and then it was like, hold on, there's just this bias against masculinity, period. Right. Hmm. And the only like, like, they don't care about uh, um, masculinity, because progressives overall have this mentality of, we want to be the voices for the most vulnerable of all vulnerable people, and they're the most important. So femininity historically and in current day is seen as more vulnerable mm -hmm. so if you're more feminine you have a higher chance of your voice being heard in the trans community um hmm. a lot of people I, I was trying to find some numbers on this i don't know how much data is a, is out there about this i saw like about 93 percent of female to males are on testosterone right but most females who are in the trans community don't identify as men as a man or as men period or you know male whatever uh they identify as what's called transmasculine mm -hmm. um which is a more all-encompassing term for you know female non-binary people who might want to you know dress more tomboyish at times and yeah. that i and from what i have seen and from what i would assume that is where the majority of females within the trans community fall um which to me tells me that there's like such an aversion to manhood period they don't even want to be associated by name with with manhood they don't want to be seen as female to male or, or or as trans men they want to be seen as trans masculine which you know distances themselves from it <laughs> um there's yeah there's just this overall bias against masculinity and against manhood which i think we call misandry you know um <laughs> and that's not something that just applies to trans men obviously this is something that like normal men i guess you could say have struggled with for decades within like progressive communities is that nobody wants to listen to their voices um and that's something that's frustrating to me because they they brand it as this like progressive thing that they're doing so we're not let the other people speak for one stop listening to the to the cis white men you know um and well now here i am now i'm going to start presenting more as a cis white man and it's like well i do have issues not just because i'm a man but also because i'm still a female you know so <laughs> it's like there are problems there um there's there's a big i think a lot of trans men i can't i can't speak for all of them but i'll speak for myself i guess there's like a almost like a depression that you go through because you were you mattered and then suddenly you stop mattering you know mm -hmm. you go from being like a, 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 a woman or at least being like a, a masculine looking female that's still there's still some sex appeal there or whatever and then just the more you become masculine they just stop caring more and more and it's like you just kind of fade into into irrelevancy and suddenly it's like you know I, I see a lot of trans women talk about like they felt so liberated when they came out and I, in some ways it's almost the opposite for me i don't know about all trans men but there's almost like this depression you go through where it's like damn i guess that's the end of the fun now now it's like you know normal life or whatever for me mm. i'm i'm happy to embrace that that's great um like normal life for me sounds awesome but the i think the problem is is that you see a lot more trans men unwilling to embrace masculinity and they'd still like to hold on to some of that femininity there and i think that's why um the reason the why privileges find... yeah yeah and i think that actually plays a lot into autogynophilia as well i think that sometimes i wonder obviously i'm not i'm not blanchard i'm not bailey i don't know anything but sometimes it seems like they're less attracted to the idea of becoming a woman and more attracted to the idea of being somebody that's actually finally listened to for once and it's like no wonder that trans women feel so liberated when they come out it's probably the first time progressives have ever listened to them uh, um 
you know, mm. in their lives. It's probably the first time they've ever had that like validation and that like attention that mo a lot of cis women get, you know, you know, on a regular basis. Uh, um, that's not to say that women don't have problems. Obviously, they do. And I would never say that like a trans woman is doing it just to escape like uh, men's issues. They're they still deal with issues for sure. But I think that it's a lot of times like the problems we go through are much less manageable when somebody else recognizes them. Um, and that, I think, is like the real, I guess, um, what do you call it, currency of the progressive movement. It's much less about privilege and much much more about recognition. Um, they will recognize people by uh, um, like an intersectional metric that they have. Um, and it doesn't really matter like how much recognition you get to them. It's all about like the intersectionality. Well, the people who are most recognized are the most privileged in, in progressive circles. They get the most uh, attention. They, they get the most people that will listen to them. Um, they get the least amount of criticism, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and the less uh, like intersectional capital you have, I guess, the less recognition your problems get. Uh, and that can cause like friction, you know. Um, I don't think that that's like a very useful model. I don't think it actually solves any progressive issues. I think all it does is open up the movement to uh, um, a massive epidemic of covert narcissism. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what I what I see more and more is that the every progressive movement to some extent seems to be hijacked by like this element of covert narcissism where suddenly it's not about being uh, um, passing. It's not about like uh, uh, living your life in a more like a uh, um, fulfilled way. It's about getting the most validation because you get none otherwise, you know? Um, so I hope, I hope all of this is making sense. Well, um, do, do, why care about progressive circles? Are you at the heart progressive? Is that, um, I, I would say I'm like quite progressive. Yeah. Um, I think that there's a lot of good things that progressivism can do for this country. Um, I think that there are, you know, uh, um, I think, you know, the male loneliness epidemic, you know, some of those things can be solved by implementing some more like progressive uh, uh, tools or whatever. Uh, you know, I think liberalism is pretty cool. Um, I, uh, I'm trying to think of other things like, you know, the gay rights movement as well. These are all like good things, you know, um, and the movements should be something that work to um, they work towards improving the country, you know. Ultimately, that's what I want. As I just want to improve the country, um, whether mm. that's like for minorities specifically or for everybody overall. It's like you know, a better America is is an America I'd like to live in. You know, so if progressives would do that, that'd be great. But they're becoming broader. They're becoming bigger, and America overall is becoming more progressive, right? And so these issues are going to start affecting more and more people. Um, if that makes any sense, hmm. um, the the biases in within the progressive movement are going to become more of more consequences. Uh, excuse me, of more consequence to the everyday American. Like the more common it gets, like you know, the more it spreads. Hmm. Um, so, so you think it should spread, but you don't want it to spread the wrong thing. Yeah, well, I think that I guess what I'm trying to say is like there, there's um. It's a growing trend. You can't really stop it. It's people are just going to become more progressive over time. I think even like younger conservatives now are more cool with like gay rights and that kind of thing, you know? So it's like that, 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 uh, um, progressive influence is there and it is strong. Um, I think a lot of times progressives think that they're still like this marginal, like hippie group from the sixties or whatever that, you know, mm -hmm. is still like kind of in the minority, but they're not like they control a lot of, you know, culture of society. Um, and it's having negative consequences on groups of people that we haven't really considered before. Um, hmm. That's kind of my premise for the whole thing, I guess. So you want uh, to out-progressive the progressive? So I, I guess that's one way to put it. I, I want, I want uh, uh, issues to be addressed and actually you know, discussed. I don't know if I will be able to achieve that, but hmm. I at least want to put out there that I think that the trans movement uh, for a large part of it is a result of toxic progressivism and that it i don't think that even a lot of progressives see trans women as women or trans men as men i think they see trans women as safe men um as men that are like feminine enough now that they're safe to be in society i think that is part of the reason why there's such a target on you know like young boys especially um and i also think that that's why for a lot of uh, females or, or people who want to become transmasculine, um, 
you'll notice a lot of them aren't very masculine. I think that's like because they want to broaden and water down the concept of masculinity to a point that they're not um, they can like be validated for mm -hmm. a sense of masculinity that's not really there. So they don't ever have to actually become that dangerous, scary, masculine, male looking person. You know, yeah. I, th I genuinely think they're bigoted towards like masculinity and men. Like, yeah, I know. wonder if I wonder if non progressive spaces actually I see them workshopping um, a more harmonious relationship between the sexes while still reifying to some degree uh, re regressive according to the progressive mindset sex stereotypes. Uh, yeah, let, let men be men, let women be women, and there's kind of a place. There's a niche for them and. These actually, you can back that up with evolutionary psychology, evolutionary biology. You don't have to enforce it, but you can be cool with norm normativity, heteronormativity. It's kind of how yeah. human beings propagate, you know? Uh, yeah. You know, and we can twiddle it this way and that way, but, you know. If, yeah, if this you... idea that we need to challenge it all is like kind of ridiculous, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's like, you just don't, it doesn't need to happen. Um, it, it's also just like, I find and you, I, you don't I, think that your life is a testament of resistance to the binary. No, no, I actually think I'm incredibly binary. <laughs> so um, yeah. I, I have no problem if people want to identify as non-binary. That's totally cool. Um, but I don't th I think that non-binary would also be erased if you actually got rid of the binary because binary is still in the word non-binary. You know, yeah. you still you still need it to exist if you want to not be that thing, you know, at least mm -hmm. that's how I understand it. it could, you know, people might disagree with me, but um, no, my, my transition has nothing to do with like a political resistance or anything like that. Um, I've always been pretty sympathetic to like the, the men's side of things, even before transitioning um, in high school. Like I, I always thought like I was very critical of feminism um, for quite a long time. I I've never understood this, like, vitriol even when i was a kid like i would see girls like just being like verbally like very cruel towards guys like i would hear them talk about how much they love to see guys cry they thought it was funny you know and it was just like well you say all this stuff and then you complain when they're toxic later in their lives it seems like you're probably influencing to us influencing that to a certain degree um but nobody ever talks about that and it's just like i think um i think if you marginalize men in this way for so long then eventually they're going to say, screw it, we'll just become women. And then now you'll finally listen to us, you know? Hmm. It hmm. Seems, like some, seems like something that could be a, a possibility, at least like from yeah. what I've seen, you know? Yeah. I know yeah. for me, there's been times where I've kind of lamented the fact that testosterone helps me so much and that this has like worked out for me so well because I have given up a lot of like benefits and stuff that it was kind of like, damn, it really would have been easier to just be like a regular cisgender woman. It's just that that was also, you know, stopping me in so many other ways that it wasn't worth holding on to, you know, those damn trade-offs. You can't have it all. <laughs> no, you can't. And I'm like, another reason to no rail a God. Like, yeah. There's no regret there on my part. It's just like, you know, you go through those like thoughts and those like yeah. periods and phases and you get experiences and it kind of like gives you a um, different impression than from what you thought life was like, you know? So what's next for you in life? Um, Honestly, and as long as we're uh, taking care of my father-in-law, I think um, that's going to be that's going to be it for a while. We're just going to keep working at our jobs and you know living our lives, taking care of him as much as we can. Once it's just the two of us, I think we're just um, hmm. probably. I'm either going to go back to school for business admin, or I'm going to you know start looking into different career paths for myself. I'm assuming he will probably do the same, and yeah. you know, we'll uh, we'll go from there. What about the sword play? Sword play? Oh, you see a sword in the background? Yeah, I see a big or... sword. I hope that's not the kind of kink that you're into, but maybe a, <laughs> maybe there's dragons down whatever southern state you're... No, no, no. It, it was part of, like, this headpiece we've got here. He's, um... Uh, my partner is really uh, connected with, like, his uh, Celtic background. Um, oh. he's, he's got, like, relations in, in Ireland, whatever, so... Um, or ancestors, I guess you say not relations. But yeah. he's collected, like, just a ton of memorabilia uh, um, and there's like this big dragon head here actually that you stick the sword through the back of it and then you can hang it up oh, on wow. the wall it's like a wall piece yeah oh, wow. so that's where that's from but we're in the middle of like moving a bunch of stuff around in between like a couple rooms so yeah what's your favorite hobby to share with your partner um 
we like to sit together and watch anime. That's one. Um, oh. Yeah, that's something we do together. Other times, like, he likes to paint little minifigures that you use in D&D. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm not a huge D&D person, but I like to draw. So sometimes we just sit together and we do our artwork. Um, What's a must-see really must see anime? Uh, Jujutsu Kaisen, for sure. Um, and if you prefer, like, a little bit more, like, a um, dramatic, raunchy humor, uh, Kanasuba is absolutely hilarious, but mm. might be more of an acquired taste for first watchers. <laughs> so. Okay, yeah, that's advanced <laughs> stuff. And do you think that um, women should be a part of the president's secret service detail, or only trans women? Trans men. Very I mean. weird. <laughs> that's a very weird question. I, I don't know. Is there like a restriction on women in the, the secret service? Or uh, I, I was being extremely date. I was dating this <laughs> interview because there was an assassination attempt a couple days ago on the president. It's true. Uh, former right. president, and there were a number of female ser secret service uh, m people who yeah. failed to perform in a way that one would hope oh. during a assassination attempt. So Interesting. I mean, I honestly could not say. I think if, um, if you're a trans man and you've got like the aggression to go with it, like maybe, mm. but I think it should probably, you should probably go through some tests to figure out if you're okay. qualified. You're still merit-based. You're merit-based. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty merit-based. Okay. Yeah. That's, if that, I, if that, that seems reasonable. If that leads to a gender bias, you know, then that's yeah. one thing, but. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah, that, that seems, yeah, just let it, uh, let the chips fall. Yeah. Confidence yeah, exactly. First. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, yeah, the, the. The misandry thing was main, the main thing that I wanted to talk to you about and stuff. So I hope I, I hope it made mm -hmm. sense at least in that it yeah. wasn't like just an unhinged ramble of delusions. <laughs> Why know? not both? Why not both? Hey, listen, some of the craziest people are the, the smartest. So yeah. who knows? We'll no, see. but thank you very much for reaching out and for being so open with your personal experience. The, you know, Absolutely. you have woven through in a unique way, this issue and it's, um, it's good to hear, you know, that you're reasonable and reason you're reasoning through this. For sure. Process. Reason has to be part of the discussion. Uh, um, I mean, it breaks my heart for people that were pressured and have kind of like mm. found their way out of the movement um, by like trial and error. Like, it, it's really sad to hear. I don't think that this medicine is anywhere near where it should be for like mainstream prescription and that kind of thing. It's like there's de needs to be a ton more research, but. That's one of the other reasons I wanted to reach out and, and kind of give my experience on it, because I think right now one of the most important things that any person struggling with gender can do is talk about it and put their words somewhere out on the Internet where it can be found for people who want to investigate mm -hmm. it at some point. Like yeah. the more testimony we have, the better, you know. Yeah, yeah. Eventually, so, anecdote yeah. does turn into data. That's absolutely. That's yeah. My contention. Yeah. And it's such a detailed issue. You kind of need to kind of need to so have anecdotes that. to a certain degree so yeah for sure yeah oliver you're a cool person how can people contact you if they so desire well honestly like after a lot of the dumb stuff i've dealt with on trans twitter i've deleted most of mine but you can oh, yeah. follow me on basic arsonist which is my art account i don't really talk about gender on there mm -hmm. um I was going to make a joke at the end and say, if this video gets 10,000 views, maybe I'll make a, a Twitter for gender stuff again. And we okay. can, uh, that way yeah. people can reach out and whatever. But um, until then, yeah, I'm just, I mainly want to focus on art. And this is yeah. uh, when coming into this interview, was, I was almost like, I was like, you know, I'm at the end of my rope with all this stuff. I'm going to say hmm. my final piece. And then if people are still interested, they can hit me up. But yeah. if not, and at least this yeah. is out there. So yeah, basic arsonist, all one word, no capital letters are weird right. numbers so yeah i'll link that down below thank you very much Oliver. thank you nice to meet you i appreciate you nice to meet you too hopefully yeah. talk to you sometime in the future yeah absolutely peace all right peace leslie yeah. oh are you still here